Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jacksonville History Show. I'm Harry Reagan. Tonight, an interview with Ed Oberly, better known for many years on the radio as Ed Bell. Uh, you came to Jacksonville in 1946, I think. That's right. Uh, to do what? Open a radio school, the Institute of Radio and Television, teaching veterans radio communications. And they would, when they finished your school, they would become engineers at a radio station. Mostly engineers, first class engineers. And the uh, school was at 8th and Main. Yes, that's right. The building is still there. Two-story building. Mm -hmm. We were on the second floor. And not long thereafter, you got into the radio business in another way as the owner of radio stations. Yeah, in 1950, I bought WIVY. It was an independent 1,000-watt daytime station, which it still is. And uh, I, at the time, I still had a radio school here. Mm -hmm. But it, it was winding down because the veterans program was expiring. So I closed the school and opened the radio station. And I had WIVY for 20 years. And uh, tell us what the landscape looked like in that uh, era. How many radio stations were there? And uh, you, you were embarking it, uh, on a new venture as an independent radio yeah, station. Yeah, I was the first independent here, WIVY. And uh, <clears throat> there were four network stations, radio stations. Mm -hmm. And WIVY was the fifth station. And the sixth station was the uh, African-American station. And so from there, it moved on to 13 stations after a year or two. And I think now there must be about 20. And it didn't seem at the time that, uh, uh, well, let's say a lot of the people who uh, were in the radio business didn't necessarily think you were going to be successful with a brand new independent station. I had the worst facility in the market. Uh, there were four network stations, and I had WIVO, which independent. At that time, if you didn't have a network, you had no s station. But I had come from New York with WNEW was a very popular music station. So I, I, I did the same programming here and put on a station playing nothing but records, music. It became what we call a music station. And w within a year, most automobile had radios tuned to the music station. And in one survey over Main Street Bridge, WIVY at that time, which was the fifth station in the market, had the number one audience in cars. Mm. What kind of music did you play? Popular music. That was unusual, too, because this was a market that was famous for uh, uh, African-American and country music. Mm -hmm. So I, I was regarded as foolish for trying to s operate a, a popular music station in this market. Yet there must have been a lot of people from the East who tuned it in. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, <clears throat> several times we had surveys taken, in automobile surveys, a Hooper survey, showed that our music station had the largest radio audience in town against four networks. At the time I bought the station, everybody said, you're crazy. Without a network, you'll starve to death. But we soon became the number one station in the market. And what's really amazing, this was a daytime station. We had no audience at night because we closed down at sundown. Mm -hmm. But the people liked popular music at that time. And there came a time when you uh, ventured forth into uh, yet another era, uncharted area, FM. Yeah. Uh, uh, in those days, AM was dominant. Right. And. Uh, you I really messed up there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought I was going to jump ahead of everybody. I was going to be number one in the market for FM. And I, uh, in fact, that was my downfall because I went into it. I'd been on WIVY, and we, we were the number one station in the market for a long time. Decided I had to have a full-time station, so I got an FM license. And I put $100,000 into the FM license. It was none, none here. It's number one, only one station. So it developed. I put it on the air and had no audience. No one 
could receive FM, Hard, basically, right? There were no radios. Yeah. But I assumed that people would be buying radios. And, but after about a year, I had no income from the station, no advertisers, because there was very few radios. So I lost enough money to quit. And uh, I, I sold WIVY uh, after 20 years. And now, of course, uh, we've come to the point where FM is the dominant. Uh, Absolutely. I, I knew that, but I jumped in a little too early. Mm -hmm. uh, I was the first FM station here in, in Jacksonville, but there was no FM radios to speak of. And eventually they did build up a big audience, but at that time I didn't have the funds to continue to lose money on it. This is not unlike the uh, TV station that came on the air, the one we're sitting into uh, for this conversation, yeah. uh, Channel 4, in 1949, no one had a TV set. Yeah. So the mission was to try to get people to buy a TV set so they could watch the TV station. Well, you know, I had the opportunity to uh, build a TV station, get a license, mm -hmm. but I, I didn't have enough nerve, as Glenn Marshall and the other fellows did, to get Channel 4. The FCC was very uh, interested in having local ownership, so I would have been welcomed with an application, but it was, it was far too expensive for me. Well, I sold WIVY in 1979, and I searched for another station. I wanted, to, after, after a year of retirement, I tried to find another station, but couldn't find one other than going way down south. So Jack Jones and I had been close friends because we both operated a radio, I operated a radio school and he operated a uh, business school. So we used to travel to the meetings a lot. So I decided to go to see him and see if he would sell me his station. So I, I talked to him and I offered him $400,000 for uh, his uh, small, station on FM. He had a little little audience, very little audience. But he said, I'll make a better deal with you. You don't have to give me anything. You take over the station and take out whatever percentage you want and run them. So I said, well, that, I could do the same thing without spending any of my money, and I did. And that's the, the way we ran the, for the years I was there. And uh, it was just as if I owned it, I could do whatever I want. But he was happy because from number 13, I made it number one in the market. It was that way for many years. And this is where a lot of people will uh, remember you uh, from daily radio commentaries yeah. on uh, Jones College Radio. Well, how, that, how I got into that was, was not by choice. Uh, I had been on the air as, as a disc jockey for many years. In fact, on WIVY, I did my own show there at the beginning. But the government required that you do so much public service on FM. So I figured the best way to do it was for me to do a commentary every day about local activities. And uh, I got into it that way. And so I started it to, to comply with the FCC requirement that you do local commitments to, to local subjects. So I started, oh, I guess 1980, when I, or 70 when I went there. So for 10 years I was doing those radio commentaries to comply with the FCC uh, rules. So uh, we kept uh, record, recording them and printing them. Mm -hmm. so each year we'd print a book of the, all of the commentaries I ran, so it was very nice. And at the, at the end, when I left the station, I had all the, the uh, tapes of my program that started in 1970 and went through 1996 when they stopped the commentary. And uh, what happened was last year my house burned down and all of my tapes burned with it. Hmm. So I lost all of those programs. So the, the tapes burned, but of course uh, the, the written version of the commentaries are still available. A lot yeah, of them books. I did. So. I write a book, wrote a book uh, mm -hmm. called Against All Odds. And uh, I have a lot of those commentaries. And another thing we want to talk about is uh, 
the emergency broadcast Yeah, I'd system. like to talk about that. The, uh, what happened was I was a member of the board of Florida Association of Broadcasters. We had monthly meetings in Gainesville at the University of Florida. And, and when the FCC started issuing uh, licenses to, for stations that would uh, broadcast uh, public emergencies, the, uh, I, we, we t I took active part. I was a member of the board of directors, and I was assigned the uh, job of getting uh, emergency broadcasting bro broadcasts in Florida by the board. So I had called meetings in every area, Miami, Pensacola, Tampa, and Jacksonville, and got the stations together because it was not easy to get them to, to cut into their programs, mm -hmm. especially television, to put on a emergency broadcasting test. And, and we had to have tests regularly. So I had to go all over the state into the five districts in Orlando, Miami, uh, Tampa, Pensacola, and Jacksonville, and have meetings to get all of the stations to comply because they were very reluctant to get involved with, especially television, with cutting into their TV programs for an emergency. And just to make sure everyone understands, uh, this functions in situations, hurricanes and other uh, emergencies yeah. as a means of communicating with Yeah, people. well it was, a, it, it, it was an essential public service, there's no doubt about it, because mm -hmm. as it is now, we get a lot of news about the hurricanes before they get here. And uh, so it, it, and it, it, the, the FCC made the rule that you can interrupt a program with this EM emergency broadcast. So, And this system was uh, copied in other states around the country. Yeah, it went all over the country. So you are the guy who's responsible for that uh, annoying uh, screech that you Yeah, <laughs> here. Uh, all about about the same time other st states were doing the same thing I'm sure but mm -hmm. it wasn't easy because you can understand that uh, television stations ha don't want to interrupt a good program f for, for no special reason and they considered this no special reason mm -hmm. but they all complied and it built it became, became very valuable mm -hmm. and you've written a book which will be coming out uh soon, we hope, called Against All Odds. Yes. Right. And uh, it, it, it opens with a very compelling sentence. I was kidnapped on my way to school when I was five years old and never saw my mother again. That's a fact, yeah. And you were kidnapped by your father. Yes. yes. So tell us a little bit about that and, and uh, early, a lot of struggles with yeah. uh, poverty yeah. and hardship in yes. your early yeah. years. My father kidnapped me on the way to school when I was five years old and uh, because he was on the outs with my mother and uh, we wound up in Baltimore, Maryland the, the, the day he kidnapped me and I never saw my mother again the rest of my life. But we traveled at, 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 and the police were out after us because he had kidnapped me. And we stayed in Baltimore, Maryland for about six months when the police found us. And the landlady where we were staying said, the police were here looking for you. And my father came home. So we grabbed a, he grabbed everything and put it in a truck. And we caught a train and went to Akron, Ohio. And we lived there for, uh, oh, eight or nine months. And again, the police came looking, and the landlady said, the police were here today looking for you to him when he got home. We immediately got on a train and left. And in this time, we got on a freight train because we had to get out of, the, of Akron, Ohio. And we went to Providence, Kentucky on a freight train. And that was quite an experience for a little boy. We, we were on the train, took us about it took us a couple of days making changes on the freight train. In the meantime, we, there was a lot of tomatoes growing in the field as we went, so we li lived on tomatoes to, for two days until we got... So my father wanted to go to Kentucky because there were a lot of good jobs in the coal mines. 
So that's where he wound up eventually in Providence, Kentucky. And he worked in a coal mine there for several, a couple of years until we just, he decided to go to Evansville, Indiana, which was close to where we were, a place to get a better job. So I wound up there at about six or seven years of age and spent the rest of my young life there, going to school, high school, and so on. Eventually wound up, it, during the Depression, we moved to Indianapolis, and it was terrible. I left and went out on my own when I was 16. I went to New Jersey where I had an aunt. Mm -hmm. So from there, I went to school. I went to night school to, and to Newark College of Engineering, and uh, finally wound up at Rutgers doing night classes. So that's where I got my education and also got my love for radio because uh, I taught uh, radio communications at Rutgers University during the war at the Signal Corps. We had two 16-month uh, eight-month courses. So I, I ran two of them for 16 months during the war. And that's how I really got my start here because after the war, I was looking for something to that I wanted to do. I had, a, I had an engineering, so I decided to come here and, and open a radio school. I had been teaching signal core classes for two years, so I had all the material. I came here and opened a school at 8th and Main Street called the Institute of Radio and Television. And I had prepared two eight-month courses from the material I had from the signal core. And I ran that school for three years, very successful, and graduated several hundred st veterans, students. Most all went to work in radio stations or radio repairs. And but during that time, I bought the radio station, WIVY. I, I had the Institute of Radio and Television on 8th and Main Street. And the GI, the GI Bill yep. was um, the way these people were going to your yeah. school, right? I had 300 veterans, yeah. uh, 150 in the daytime and 150 at nighttime classes. I, it's hard to overstate the importance of the GI Bill in so many lives. It's true. People don't really. There was a lot of uh, uh, training that was, ins it, it was insignificant. It, it is true. But there was a lot very valuable. Even barber schools and mm -hmm. things like that, there were trades that these boys could get into. And we trained the uh, veterans for radio repair service or for broadcast engineers. Every radio station has to have a licensed broadcast engineer. And it's a difficult uh, test to pass, so we taught our veterans to pass that test. Well, so, Against All Odds is definitely uh, an appropriate name for your autobiography. Yeah, because of the childhood, uh, that we, I went through a pretty sorry space. And also, uh, there's this part of my life that uh, even at age 16, during, there was a terrible depression. My father moved to Indianapolis, and I went there with him. He couldn't get a job. There were no jobs to be had. And I was working in a league at uh, Soda Fountain. I was supporting him and in a furnished room for a long, long time. And it, it, the story is that he brought in another uh, uh, guy to live with us in our little furnished room, bedroom. And I didn't like that. So I got up and ran away and left and went out on my own at age 16. Hmm. And uh, everything I did from then on was alone. And uh, just to follow up on that, uh, you I subsequently re reconnected with your dad, or? Not ev eventually, yeah. Uh, just on one occasion, my aunt got us together. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, we were separated. I was on my own at age 16, but I still continued to go to school. Mm -hmm. And I went to night school to, to uh, Newark College of Engineering and Rutgers, so. Well, let's come back to Jacksonville. It's uh, post-war Jacksonville. Yeah. Uh, you came here in 46. Yeah. Um, and one of the interesting things that uh, it, you have to 
pay attention to in your resume is you were one of the founders of the San Jose Country Club. Yes. And I think that is a, a really important fact. Yeah, I think we had, I'd say 12 people uh, that, the, that started the club. They, well, it was more than 12 because we had to, we had to get 300, the 12 people, we had to gather up businessmen. We got 300 local businessmen to put up $1,000. To acquire the land and yeah, and start. Bold, bold School is was a, a, a beautiful hotel for many years, many years ago during the nineteen twenties, uh, and they had their own go golf course. So we had a, a group of about a oh, hundred men, local businessmen, who bought the property from Bold School. And so, what is now the San Jose Country Club? was part of that hotel that's right, property. That's right. They had they had their own golf course. Mm -hmm. The bowl the, the bowl school was a was a resort. Mm -hmm. And they had their own golf course, so we bought the golf course for I think three hundred thousand dollars. We all pitched in a thousand dollars. And I don't know how many they might have been whatever it was, it was enough to buy the land. And the, it it was an old dilapidated building but a beautiful Spanish architecture. So we restored it. And today, you still play some golf. Yeah, I and play you, golf you there, visit yeah. the San Jose Country Club on a regular basis. Yeah. You must be very proud. Oh, yeah. And we have, tw have 1,200 members, about, I believe, now at San Jose. It's a beautiful place. I've built my life around that with my family. We, we lived uh, a couple of miles away, and that was the center of our life. Mm -hmm. So we've had a beautiful life. And in addition to running radio stations and, uh, and so forth, you were involved in a lot of uh, civic affairs. Uh, I mean, the San Jose Country Club is part of it, but there was the Commodores League. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Well, I had a big boat, a yacht, for a long time, a 40-foot 40, 40 Hatteracy. And uh, I decided to... Uh, form a yacht group of, of people who were interested in boating and I put together a group called the Commodores League. Uh, Forty people, including Dick Suddeth and uh, a lot of prominent businessmen. And uh, the idea was, and many of these had yachts, the idea was to work with the Chamber of Commerce to uh, entertain VIP business people come into town to show them what a great place Jacksonville was. Mm -hmm. So we we set that up and it's running still. It's still running. They have about, we had a limit of 40, I think they have, have 50 members. They meet every month at Epping Forest. And showing Jacksonville off from the water was and still oh, is a, a very uh, good it's thing a, to especially do. Especially with people who are interested in putting a starting a business here or something mm -hmm. like that. So they still do that. Well, the commentaries became very, very successful. In fact, they were so much so that we'd put them in books. And mm -hmm. each year, we'd print, uh, Jones College would print uh, s several hundred books of the commentaries for that year. So we had, uh, and uh, I had them from 1980 to 96. And I had copies of them, and a house burned down about a year ago and burned all of those commentaries up. And music changed, and what was popular music was something different uh, at a point. I, I guess you segued into rock and roll and... Not much, no. a little. Well, yeah, Elvis Presley, of course. You ha we, we, in fact, I, I'm, I have one great honor. I introduced Elvis Presley from the Florida Theater when he came here. And where was Judge Gooding? And Judge Gooding, <laughs> said, he sent out a notice and said that if he wriggled his lips, his, uh, his hips, he'd put him in jail. So you were, you were introducing Elvis. Yeah. And the judge was uh, putting pressure on uh, yeah. the kind of performance that Elvis yeah, was He didn't want to see any hip shaking there. Yeah. So uh, what, tell us what happened. Well, he, he did a show at the Florida Theater, and I emceed it. And it was the, the, 
the theater was packed to the rafters, and it was full of teenagers, so you can imagine. And he was, I met him, he was a great guy, good-looking young guy, and uh, the Florida Theater has the uh, a place upstairs, have a walkway going upstairs where the artists change clothes and so on. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I went with him a little bit. He, he was a very nice guy. At, at that time, he was nothing as great as he no. became. He hadn't become the king. No, he was just... Uh, but a nice guy, and uh, that night, at least, uh, he performed under Judge Gooding's restrictions. That's right. It's, he sure did, because Judge Gooding said if he wriggles his hips the way he has been, he'll go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is an interesting uh, yeah. chapter or sub-chapter in your life. Yeah, yeah. Your, your well, connection. it's an honor. Who yeah. else can say they introduced Elvis Presley on the stage or anywhere? <laughs> anywhere, but that that particular concert because of the, the controversy. Yeah, he had ju he's just beginning. He's just starting yeah. his career. Yeah, this would have been fi mid fifties, early fifties, I guess. 50s. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He and, and also Pat Boone was just starting his career, and Pat lived here mm -hmm. with his grandmother, so. He was often at our house. Mm -hmm. He's a great guy. Yeah. Great family man. I, the first thing I did when I got here was go up to the, I think, the 10th floor of the Barnett Bank building where the former mayor, Alsop, had an office. And I think that was a smart thing because he gave me a lot of pointers about the city. That was the first day I was here. I went to see him. So someone coming to Jacksonville to start a business. Yeah. And he was yeah. very nice. I think and he was, John, was the former mayor. John Alsop, uh -huh. yeah. So, There's a bridge uh, named after him. Yeah. The Main Street Bridge. Most people call it the Main Street Bridge, but yeah. it's named after him. Yeah, So right. he welcomed you. He was glad to see you. Oh, he was a fine gentleman. T told me all about, you know, the town, how, how great it was going to be. And he was right. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was just at the beginning of its... Uh, real life. Because mm -hmm. at that time, when I came here, I think there was 75,000 people in the city. Some people had 100,000. Yeah. You could walk down the street and everybody knew you, mm -hmm. you know, hey, there's Ed Bell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, believe it or not, my name's not Ed Bell, but people still call me that when I walk down the street. Sure. <laughs> and I think people will want to know uh, what you're doing these days. Uh, playing golf. Playing golf, finishing <laughs> your autobiography. And writing a book. And, uh, and enjoying life. Yeah. I, well, I think I'm entitled to it. I'll be 98 years old next week. Yeah. <laughs> well, happy birthday a week early. Yeah. And uh, thank you very much, Ed Oberly, Ed Bell, yeah. for uh, being with us. Well, thank you for inviting me.